called Make Your Own Copy. Now, we've been talking about Solomon quite a bit in our studies in If God Be For Us, because God really was for him in his early days. He was humble. He was anxious to serve. He was eager to do what was right. And he tried to worship God the way God wanted him to worship. And he made this beautiful prayer at the dedication of the temple, which we looked at yesterday. But before he becomes a king, some of the last words of his father, King David, are recorded for us in 1 Chronicles 28, 9. Now, it was a southern preacher who was very effective in his preaching to his congregation. And they asked him one day, why are you so successful? He says, well, I does tell him what I'm going to tell him. And then I tell them, and I tell them what I done told them. <laughs> so what he's saying there, good points bear repeating. <laughs> and so these are words which David said to a young boy, 19 years old. Know the God of David. He's talking about himself. Listen, listen to, my, to me, my son. And serve God with your loyal heart and with a willing mind. Well, well, why, Dad? Well, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If, big word, if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. And that's the choice we each are making this week and all our life. Are you seeking God or are you not seeking him? He knows. You, know, you can say, oh, I love the Lord. So many people, oh, I love God. Do you ever read his book? Oh, no, but I love him. You can't even love him if you don't read his book. You can't know, about, you can't know what he said. So we tried to stress last night how important it was to read our Bible as well as pray. We can't do without either one of those. There's a song, you can't do one without the other. I don't know what the rest of the song is like. I don't even know the tune. But that was right. These are two things that go together, uh, prayer and Bible reading. And don't be one of those that wants to do all the talking. There's a sad story about a, a woman who was divorcing her husband. She told the judge, my husband has not spoken to me in 20 years. And the judge was kind of surprised. He, he calls the man, is, is that right? He says, yes, Your Honor, she's right. He says, well, why haven't you spoken to her in 20 years? He says, I didn't want to interrupt her. <laughs> Do you really know any people like that? Just, never let, you can't, can't even get a word in edgewise. Now, don't be that way with God. He, he doesn't want you to pray, but he wants you to listen to him too, and you do that when you open your book, his book, the Bible. So Paul, talking to his young son, son in, not in the flesh but in the truth, he says, from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. So, so Timothy was brought up in the truth by his mother and his grandmother, Eunice and Lois. He said, from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures. What, what, what's that going to do for you? He says, they are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so the next verse, Paul says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And so the reading of the Bible is the difference between life and death for all of us. Don't let your Bible readings go undone. A lot of people have written wise sayings for the benefit of others, and those who received the wise sayings, don't bother to read them. Now here is a true story about a young man who started a business and his business prospered and it grew. And eventually he owned a corporation who had branches in all major cities in the United States with thousands of employees. And he was now an old man and he cared about his employees. And so he, he decided he would write them a newsletter every week giving them counsel and advice on how to be successful and prosper in his business. 
And he sent these letters out by mail. It was long before email and that kind of thing was around. He sent them out in a blue envelope every week to every employee. Also every week, every employee, because they were scattered all over the United States, received a paycheck, which was in a yellow envelope. So every Friday, two envelopes would arrive, a blue one and a yellow one. One had this paycheck in it, and one had the, the, the words of the corporation president, the founder of the company, who was caring for his employees and giving them good advice. But when he would talk to the employees, he, he discovered that he didn't think they were reading his letter. So he said, this disturbs me. I'm going to just do a little test to see if they're reading my letter. So the next week, he sent out the envelopes, and he put at the bottom of his own letter, if any of you who will just sign the bottom of this letter saying, I have read what you said, sign their name to it and mail it back to me, I will send them a $500 bonus. He had thousands of employees. He got back five letters. They were not listening to the boss. And that's true of the world who don't listen to the boss our Heavenly Father. Now, as a sequel to that story, I started my little business in 1953. And for first, I was just me. And now our little company has grown to where I have over 40 employees. But our corporation uh, joined an, some other corporations to form a, a kind of a conglomerate, very small one, called United Agencies, where we pooled our buying power so that we could represent as a group to, to the insurance companies. So we give each of the insurance companies that we represent many millions of dollars a year. And so we have clout with them. Each one of us individually doesn't have that clout that we have together. So it's called United Agencies. And so we have a, a board meeting once a month of the directors of United Agencies. And I always went to the board meetings and I always read the minutes. And I'm reading the minutes, this is a few years back now, Gary Conkey is the secretary and he writes in the minutes, at the bottom of the, of the minutes he says it was moved second and carried by the, the board that the good old boy bonus of $500 be given to the secretary. Well, I was there. <laughs> I didn't, that didn't happen. I, can't, I says, Gary, I just read the minutes. What's this good old boy bonus of $500? Bob says, well, he says, I just put that in to see if anybody was reading my minutes. <laughs> and he told me later that I was the only one in the company that I called him on it. <laughs> so you see, this is not unusual that people are trying to help other people by writing them letters and they ignore them. And God knows that it's happening to him too. Because this is his love letter to us. He so loved us, he gave us his son. He so loved us, he gave us his book. A book that is able to make us wise to salvation. And we ignore it to our own peril. And so, God looking into the future, back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, if you want to go there, he knows what they're going to happen, and this was... He's writing this through Moses hundreds and hundreds of years before it was ever going to happen. Joshua comes on the scene. The judges are on the scene for some 400 years. And God, looking down through time, wrote and had Moses write down in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14, God saying, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and you dwell in it, I know what you're going to do. You will say, I, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. And you know that's what happened. Samuel was very upset when they rejected him. God says, you have, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. So God is talking to these people long before this is ever going to happen. He says, now when you get this king, you're going to, you're going to choose him among your brethren. You may not set a foreigner over you that is not your brother. Now, I want to, I'm going to give some advice to this future king, which is way down the line from what, what is happening. Verse 16, this king shall not multiply horses for himself. Verse 7, neither shall he multiply wives for himself. Neither shall he multiply silver and gold for himself. So God knew way back then that kings ought not do these things. 
So he's giving good advice, and of course, all the kings that came along had access to these words, which were written and down in the first five books of the Bible. And so God says, I tell you what I want this king to do when he comes, becomes king. Verse 18. It shall be when this king sits on his throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from before the priests of Levi. It shall be with him, not only was he to write it out, he was to lab labor laboriously write his own copy. No photocopy, no, no, photo, no cameras. He was to, and no, not, not even typewriters and computers. He was to take a pen and a quill and dip it in ink and write out the, the first five books of the Bible. What if we were assigned to you, and when you get home from the Bible school, I want you to get some paper out and, and a pen or ballpoint pen. No ballpoint pens in those days. It was a lot. And write the whole first five books of the Bible. Write them out. Make your own copy. That is what God was telling each king to do. And he's going to tell us not only where they to do it, but why they were to do it. So what, you should write this copy out in verse 19, and this copy shall be with him. And he's then, even though he's written it out, he's supposed to keep reading it. Well, I've already written it. Well, you need to read it over again. The fact you wrote it out, you don't remember it all. Keep reading over what you wrote. And he shall read all of it in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. Why? Verse 20, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may turn, may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now that's what God said kings ought not do. Come to Second Chronicles chapter 1, verse 16, and Solomon had horses imported from Egypt. Verse 25 of Second Chronicle 9, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. What did God say? Don't, 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 don't accumulate horses. If you go to Israel, you can visit the, the stables of, of, of Solomon. You can see the stalls where all the horses were. They're still there. There's no horses in them anymore. But Solomon was told not to do it, and he did it. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14, the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. What did God say? Don't multiply silver and gold. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3, and Solomon had 700 wise princes and 300 concubines. Had a little test in a Sunday school class, and they said, how many wives and concubines, how many, how many wives did Solomon have? The little boy said, he had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. <laughs> well, porcupines and concubines sort of sound alike, and I tell you, they were sticky. <laughs> and I didn't finish the verse. The best verse, the rest of that verse, which I'd stopped in the middle of, it says, his wives turned away his heart. God knew what was best for them, and they didn't do it. You cannot play fast and loose with God. He tells you that this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Don't you let it depart out of your mouth. Those were words that God said to Joshua. And I, when I taught here in 1980, we, I had the subject Joshua for, my, for the young people. And there's some people in this audience today who were in my teenage class in 1980 and they're sitting here now as grandparents. And I remember walking from the dining hall to Seavers with a sweet little young teenage girl. And we locked arms. And as we walked along, we said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way possible, and then shalt thou have good success. You want to be prosperous? You want to be successful? Read the Bible. The next verse. Uh, I, if I stop in the middle, I gotta, I gotta start over again. <laughs> that thou mayest be prosperous. For then shalt thou have, that, have that I commanded thee. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, with us wherever thou goest. And that young sister, still young to me, she old, she's a grandmother, can recite those words to you today. And she learned them back in 1980. So you see how important it is that the Word of God, not, not just to read it, 
not just to copy it, but to even memorize it. Because what you have in your mind, you can take with you no matter where you are. Even if you're in intensive care with all bound up, you can still say verses if you got them here. But I couldn't read a Bible, but I could quote my verses to me, and I tell you they were a comfort at a time when I was really needing comfort. So, so God said, do this, lest your heart be lifted up. In 2 Chronicles 26, 16, we talk about a king named Uzzah. He was one of the good kings. There were not very many good kings of Israel. He made mistakes. Of course, we all make mistakes. But he had been a good king. And what did he do? When he was strong, Uzzah, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. You may be turned into a leper. He became white as snow. Because he, he was not listening to God. You can't play fast and loose with God. Whatever he says, no matter how, what, how insignificant it may seem to you, you must obey it. To the letter. Don't swear, you don't swear. He didn't copy his book, Bible. He wasn't reading it. His heart was lifted up. Hezekiah, one of the best kings that the children of Israel had. Second Chronicles 32, 25. Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown unto him. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. Those were good kings whose heart was lifted up because they didn't copy down their Bible and they didn't read it. And I'm sure they didn't memorize it because if you didn't read it, you, you won't certainly memorize it. So those are good kings. Now the same thing is said of bad kings, the king of Tyre. The, God says to him in Ezekiel 28 too, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. Therefore you set your heart as a heart of a God. Though you set your heart as a heart of a God. And in Ezekiel 28, in Daniel chapter 5, you know the story about Daniel. You know the story of Nebuchadnezzar. You know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and he took, him, took his glory from him. He became like an animal and ate grass for seven years. I mean, God is able to abase people who are puffed up. So Peter says, you younger ones, you all young to God, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. What are you wearing? Well, I can see what you're wearing. Uh, can I see your humility? You know, people who have humility don't walk the same as people who don't have it. I, I can remember being in high school when the, when the fellows that were the big men on campus, you know. <laughs> I mean, they were so full of pride, <laughs> it was disgusting. Even people in the world don't like to see other people have pride. Muhammad Ali, I'm the greatest. Even people in the world like to see a little bit of humility in somebody else. Not in themselves, but in you. God hates pride. Psalmist lists seven things that God hates. Number one, pride. And what does the world think about pride? It's a virtue. I have my pride. The world has everything backwards. And if we don't, if we just are in the world and be part of the world, we'll have things backwards. We have nothing to be part of. Anything you have has been given to you by God. You can't be proud of you have blue eyes or brown eyes. I mean, you inherited it from your parents. No virtue of yours. Whatever, everything we have is a gift. You must be puffed up about something God gave you, but he did give it to you to use. So if you have a beautiful voice and you can sing, then sing for us. But don't be proud of your voice. Be thankful. There's a difference between being thankful and being proud. I've had people say, I guess you're proud of your kids. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm very thankful for them. <laughs> Our little company was being sued once, we don't do, do lawsuits, but sometimes you get sued. 
it was over nothing, totally not, not our fault, but we were being sued. And so they, I was the president at the time, so they gave me a deposition. I had to go in before a courtroom and give this deposition and talk about my, my staff. So they were trying to swear me in. Of course, I wouldn't do that. So then they're asking me about my staff, and I'm telling them about what a wonderful people that work for us. The attorneys are interrogating me, and I'm, I'm really laying it on thick because I'm, I want them to know how good these people are that they're accusing of doing something wrong. He said, I guess you're proud of your staff, aren't you? I says, no, I'm not. The Bible condemns it. Oh, he said, oh. I said, I'm only thankful for them. But you see, the world doesn't think right. And if you don't follow the Bible, you won't either. Because pride is an easy thing to have. And we have to fight it. And if any of you say, I'm not proud at all, you'll tell other lies too. <laughs> so we mustn't ever get the big head about anything that God has given us. Just go out and use it for his glory and honor. And so I have some favorite Bible verses. I guess all of us do. And I think we should memorize them. And you've been given some of them already this week, and I hope that you will maybe uh, commit some of them to memory. I, you, this is not a test. You had a test last night, but only you know the score. <laughs> but uh, I just believe that all of us, and I've had people tell me, especially some older people. <clears throat> you know how old people are. <laughs> <laughs> And I've, I've had dear old sweet sisters come to me, and I've given them a Bible verse, and I said, try to memorize this. And I've had them come, Bob, you know, I just cannot memorize. I, I just, just can't do it. I said, what's your phone number? <laughs> you know they know it. <laughs> what's your mailing address? They know it. I said, I thought you said you couldn't memorize. Well, that's important. Oh! <laughs> you memorize only what's important. <laughs> What about the Bible? <laughs> See, in little ways, we justify not doing what we don't want to do or justify doing what we want to do. <clears throat> so you can memorize. I don't care how old you are, you can memorize. John McConville's mother lived into her 90s, and she was still memorizing Bible verses when she was dying. So never, ever think you can't. <clears throat> you just put them where you see them all the time, and read them every day, and <laughs> you just absorb them. You can't, you can't help yourself. I mean, if you watch a lot of television, you know a bunch of stuff that you don't want to memorize, but they drum, drum it into you. You, know, you hear it every day, the ditties and stuff. What, 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 well, don't let that stuff fill your mind. Fill, fill it with this. And when you see a good verse that you like, you know, memorize it. Write it on a slip of paper. Stick it, stick it on the on the mirror in the bathroom. Stick it over the sink. Stick it on the dashboard of your car. <laughs> I was in Australia. I'd been giving talks like this. And in Australia, um, th their houses, they, if you ask for the t bathroom, you, it's a bathroom. There's a tub in there. <laughs> in old houses, no stall, no showers either. But, but the, what they call a WC, water closet, is a different little building little room all by itself. It's a nice, not a bad idea. Uh, but I go into, into the water closet, and on the back of the door, are all these Bible verses that I've given out in the past, <laughs> setting on the, tape, taped on the, on, on the door. So you see, your brain can be doing lofty things while your body is doing other things. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a matter, are you motivated to put God first in your life? <laughs> and so we're com coming to 2 Kings chapter 22, and we're going to talk about a little boy named, named well, I'll his name is Josiah, but he was only eight years old. So I just had the teenagers this morning, and I, there were no eight-year-old people in our class because they were too young to, to be in. I have the bigger kids, the teenagers. So Josiah was only eight years old when he became king. Imagine a little eight-year-old. There's some eight-year-olds here. You ought to pick out an eight-year-old and say, you know, Josiah was a king when he was your age. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. How old was he when he died? 39. How'd you know that? He added 31 and eight together. 
That's what it adds up to. Because he stopped being king when he died. He was king to his death. So if he became a king at eight and died at 31, and lived 31 years, he died at 39. Now, he was a young man when he died. And he was one of the best kings that Israel had, that Judah had ever had. And we're told in verse 2 of chapter 22, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn from the right side to the left. Now, that's only said about two kings, Hezekiah and Josiah. So now, 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and 2 Kings 22 are parallel chapters. It's like the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sometimes you get a little bit more in one and you compare it with the other. You put them together, you get the whole picture. So in 2 Chronicles 34 and 3, again, talking about Josiah, it says in the eighth year of his reign, how old was he then? 16. You, you're good at math. Eight and eight or 16. So here's the, so I had all, all the 16-year-olds in my class stand up this morning. I don't suppose there's any 16-year-olds in this class. You're supposed to be down there if you're 16. So he's, he's 16 years old. He begins to seek the, Lord, the God of his father in the, in the 12th year. Now, how old is he? 20. Any 20-year-olds in the room? Any 20-year-olds? No, no 20-year-olds. Well, really? I'm surprised there's not a 20-year-old in here. We're all over the, where is one? Oh, there they are. There they are. There's the, just imagine you're 20 now. We're talking about a fellow who's 20, your age, and what's he going to do when he's 20? I mean, let's bring this down to us. Uh, he began, and in the 12th year, he's 20 years old, Judah and Jerusalem, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. He, he, they purged the wooden images, the carved image, and the molten image. They, they shouldn't have had these things. Here's a 20-year-old boy saying, we're going to get rid of all this junk. <clears throat> Can you imagine the people who made those things? They, they, some of them were great carvers. You know, They, they had great skills to make graven images. <clears throat> In fact, Demetrius was really upset because Paul was putting him out of business. You know, they, they made all these shrines to Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. <clears throat> you touch a person's pocketbook, it's the most tender place you can hit them. And so he's, he's destroying all these things that they worshipped because they were wrong to worship them. Now, you don't have any graven images in your house. I'm, I'm sure of that. But do you have anything in your house you worship? Is there anything in your house that's so important? We, we had a brother out our way many years ago who went away I don't know if it was on a trip or just out to the store, but he, he came back and the thieves had the front door open and they were carrying his stuff out and putting it in a pickup truck parked in his driveway. Of course, when he, they arrived, that, that stopped them from doing it. <laughs> but he was so afraid that someone might come back and steal from him again, he would not leave the house. You know, he died and there's nobody guarding that stuff anymore. I mean, it's, it's all stuff. And we're supposed to lay up our treasure in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt. And thieves cannot break through and steal. Thieves can steal your stuff. But they can't hurt you. Or they, can, or they could kill you if the criminals do kill other people. They, if you catch a, th a thief in the middle of robbing you or something, he may kill you, but he, he can't hurt your eternal life and that's bound up in Christ and God. So, He's now 20 years old, and 2 Chronicles 34, 4 says, they broke down the altars of Baal in his presence. Now, here's the king. He's not sitting up on a fancy throne just twiddling his thumbs. He's out there on the job site making sure, tear that down, rip that down, crush that. He was a 20-year-old young man bent on serving God and doing what's right, and boy, did he upset a lot of people. You can just know how many people that's upset because he was putting God first in his life. Now, you remember back in the Judges when Gideon broke down the Baals, our altars. When they found out it was Gideon, they were going to kill him, and his father had to come to his rescue and rescue, save him from that famine. So now we have instances in the Bible of where well, Hezekiah, when he was a young man, he was 25. I suppose there's some 25-year-olds in here, too. We've got 20s. So somebody should be 25. But there's this brass serpent which God told Moses to make. 
So this, this was one serpent that was okay to make. And they put up on a pole. And all the real serpents were running around the ground, biting people, and they were dying. And he said, just look up at that serpent on the pole, and you won't die. So that was a really a special serpent. So the children of Israel said, wow, look what this did for us. We'll keep it. So what happened? They, started, they began to worship it instead of God. And Hezekiah comes to the throne, and he says, take it up, and grind it up, and throw it away. You can't do that. Now who stand, he says, a piece of brass. The point is, what's in your life, in your garage, in your home, at your place of worship, at your place of work, that you're God? People do have gods other than the God of heaven. Anything that comes between you and God is your God. And he won't allow anything to come between him and you. Some people even do. I've, heard, I've had people I know leave the truth. And they come to me and they say, well, I can't come to meeting anymore because brother so-and-so or sister, they come between me and God. Did you hear what they said? They have come between them. This person has come between me and God. Who's closer to God if somebody's between me and God? They are. By their very words, they're admitting that the person they don't like is closer to God than they are. Because they let them come between them. Nothing must could come between us and God. Not a person. Not a thing. Not a career. Certainly not money. Nothing. But things do come between us if we're not careful. And so we must be careful to put God totally first in our life. And he won't take second fiddle. He cannot be your co-pilot. He has to be first in your life. Now, Josiah decides he's going to cleanse the temple. It's a very good idea because his parents... And grandparents had let it fall into disarray. And he hires workers to go in there and clean it out. And they're in, there, they're in the house of God cleaning out the rubble, the rubbish, the stuff that's accumulated. <laughs> and they go, reach down on some shelf somewhere and they take out a, a book covered with dust. <laughs> What's that? It, it, was, it was the first five books of Moses. It was God's book. Do you realize that God's book was lost in the house of God? And nobody even knew it was there. And they found it. And they brought it to King Josiah. And he, he, they said, Hilkiah the priest said, Shaphan has given me a book. Hilkiah gave the book. And Shaphan brings the book to Josiah. He says, look what we found. We found... The, the book of God. We found the book of Moses. And Josiah says, read it. And they began to read it. And when they read it, they realized that they had been doing wrong. And if you do your Bible readings every day, you'll constantly be reminded of what you've been doing wrong. See, this book is not just a book to read. It's a life to be lived. So we take these words and we learn them and then we go out and use them. We, we have to put it into action in our life. And that's exactly what Josiah did. In fact, is, brothers and sisters, you're going to do it, I hope, today also. You're going to do what Josiah asked his followers to do. Because they read this book and he, 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 was, he, tore, he ran his clothes. He realized how sinful they'd been. That they, he said, yeah, Go inquire the Lord for me. This is 2 Chronicles 34, 21. He's read this. He knows, what, oh, we, we've been doing everything wrong. Go inquire the Lord for me and for those left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of God who is pour, has been poured out upon our fathers. They have not kept the word of the Lord in doing all that is written in this book. So he was convicted in his heart. And we know that his 
own son, when Jeremiah went to him with the word of God, he took a penknife and cut off the pages and threw it in the fire. Some people hear the word of God, <clears throat> they repent, they beg God for forgiveness, <clears throat> they seek God, and God will be for them, and he'll bless them. Others hear the word of God and say, I don't have time for that. I've got a career, I've got things to do, I've got my sports, I've got my family, I've got whatever it is. <clears throat> and they turn away from God. And so that's a great tragedy. And Josiah was a man of action, and he realized that they needed to do something about it. So the king sent and gathered all the elders of Israel and Judah, and the king went to the house of God. And he read, them, read in the hearing all the words of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. I've, I've got something here, brothers and sisters, I want to share with you. That's, that's what's that's really happening this week, isn't it? You've imported three speakers, one from Australia, and one from England, and one from California, to, 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 to bring you a message of hope and salvation so that when you leave this place, you'll go better, leave better than when you came. That, that's our goal. And if, and if you don't leave better than you came, we three failed you. We might as well have stayed home. Matt should be back home with those six little kids and his wife. And Sister Jane and Brother Michael have a family in Birmingham. And I've got one in California. And if you don't get moved by what we've done this week, since you're going to do better than you've ever done before, we can stay home. And just let you go on doing what you want to do. So, so this is very important. What we're talking about, if God be for you. But you see, Josiah didn't just read the Bible and say, well, that's, I'm sure glad of that. I'm, I'm going to do better now. No, he put it into practice in his life. And then he asked the, his congregation to do that too. So runners went through all Israel and Judah with the letters to the king. They, they, and they asked him to return to the Lord. He'll have compassion on us. And some of the people laughed him to scorn. Oh, don't be such a funny daddy. We got a life today. We're not going to be bothered with that. You see, we're all three brethren, and everyone else involved in the school, all dedicated to trying to help all of us together to get in the kingdom. It's not a do-it-yourself kid. So, so Josiah, we're told in Second Chronicles 34, 31, 32, he stood in his place, and he said, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to make a covenant with the Lord. I'm going to make a commitment to God starting today to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all my heart. And I want you to do it too. So he says, I want you to stand to this. I'm not going to ask you to stand up now. But, but, but he's asking you to stand to making this promise. And so today's handout is different from everyone you've been given this week so far. Because this one has a place to sign. At the bottom it says, sign this blank day of blank and another line to put your name. Because this morning we're going to ask you to sign this promise. And you might say, well, wait, I don't need to do that. I was baptized 20 years ago, 30 years. I've been baptized 70 years ago. I still need to keep making a new commitment. I signed this today again. I'm asking you to do something I didn't do. I've signed these before because I've done this before. But the point is we always, all of us all the time, need to be recommitting our life to God. To each day say, it's a new day, God. I'm going to try to do better than yesterday. So this is what, 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 what you're going to receive. <clears throat> You can scratch it out. You can change it. If you think you can improve on God's word, go ahead. <laughs> I do hereby promise to the very best of my ability. So I'm, this is not a vow. And, and I actually got a little qualification there. I mean, you, you can't wiggle out of this. If you're really making a promise, but if you don't want to sign this, don't tell me. <laughs> I do here promise to the very best of my ability that I will walk. Now I'm quoting, this is scripture. I will walk after the Lord. This is, this is Josiah. These are Josiah's words, which I'm borrowing. I will walk after the Lord, keep his commandments and his testimonies 
and his statutes with all my heart and with all my soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in the Bible. Second Chronicles 13:13. 